Hey, new podcast, new podcast. And uh, it's awesome. I've been a fan of this woman for uh, probably 18 years. I first, I tell her this every time I see her, I tell her how hard she made me laugh the first time I ever saw her perform. She did this character that was like a showcase girl or like a spokesmodel. It was fucking so hilarious. And everything she's done has been varied. She is a huge working actor. The last thing I saw her in where I was like, shut the fuck up, was night school with my daughter. She killed it. She kills it as a comic, but she murders it as an actress. She really murders it as an actress. I have one regret in this podcast. I didn't talk to her about her cat. Me and my daughters love her cat. I think she's got one of those Savannah monitor Savannah cats that are like the size of a dog. That's my only regret. So I'll have her back on the podcast. She's awesome. You're going to love this conversation. Ladies and gentlemen, my friend, stand-up comedian, actress, Instagram star, Marilyn Rice Cub. Hello. Hello. Hey, how you doing? Hello. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, can you hear me? I hear you perfect. I hear you perfect. <laughs> Isn't that what every couple wants just to be heard? I hear you more perfect than you hear. That's when it gets into the wrong territory. It's like, it's not a competition. <laughs> Just I was, uh, I was 25. No, I was 20. No, I was, I was 29 when I first started listening to women. Get the age right. Because I need to know what happened between 25 and 29. Uh, I'll tell you what happened. I broke up with it. Chick broke up with me and I was devastated. And I thought the only way you'll ever get a woman is to be rich and skinny and like, and so I just said, I'm going to focus on me and get me to be the best me I can be. And then I'll get the woman I want. And then, but I didn't realize that I didn't realize that I was a bad person. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't realize I needed to do work on myself and that I had sincere issues. I love that so much. Just the list is like really long. You're talking for five minutes and then this and then that and then that. And then I'm a bad person is really. I was a bad. You know, what's so funny. I, I was a bad person. I think I still am. I think there's I there's I know for a fact in raising two daughters that I fall short. Very often, like very, very very often where i say things where I, I say things and then i lay in bed and i regret having said them all the time but and i i'm gonna use you as an example i knew i was a good person because i liked your stand-up <laughs> does that make sense <laughs> please explain i remember the first time i ever saw you it was at the i, I was a big I did not theater. see this one coming <laughs> it was no but you, do you ever feel like there's people you like their stand up, and then that makes you feel like you're a better person. Like you go, like I mean, I look. I, I can't there's, make this look, right now. I'm too sensitive. I'm gonna cry. Like Patrice O'Neill, I, I like to stand up. That doesn't make you a better person. At the end of the day, you're like, <laughs> yeah, like of course I like it. I got problems. I got issues. I need to go to therapy. And but then there's people like, um, like yourself, uh, Patton. Um, uh, I would say David Cross, but David Cross is a little darker. Um, but there's certain acts that like. Uh, Moshe, um, uh, Paul F. Tompkins. There's, there's certain, uh, Eddie Pepitone, you know, there's certain acts where you go, you like them and then you feel like you're a, you feel like you're like, I'm, I'm going in the right path. Does that make sense? I, I love it. Whatever you're getting at with that, I'll take it. But it's, I'm yeah, curious. I'm better I'm, than you, I think is what I'm hearing. I'm a better you, you person. Are, by always the way, you have are. been, always will be. Uh, no, I remember the first, let, are we, are we doing this? I remember the first time I saw you at the improv sold out a long time ago though. You know, it was before superstar you, but you were pretty, uh, I, I, my point is I just, you were, <laughs> I like you where this is going. So, uh, I had never seen somebody so magnetic and like, I just felt like I was, I was like, what did I just like, I entered this guy's oh, that's very party weird. and I I'm a part of it. Like so infectious. And, um, and that was that. Well, thank you. I feel like my daughter is a Mary Lynn rice cub. I feel like my, my youngest daughter is you. I, f I feel like something you do very well is you translate, you translate, uh, your vulnerability very well as an actress and but more importantly when when you get on stage in stand-up you definitely 
translate your vulnerability and, and a character for some reason you can find the thing that like you know that that speaks to the thing that makes us uncomfortable about ourselves or or and my my youngest daughter isla is i i mean i really honestly i i'm curious to know your path because i'm curious to know her path does that make sense oh, like i'm boy. curious to know what gave you the bravery to get into the entertainment business what gave you the bravery to get on stage the first time and then and then i want to know about I, i'm really curious about when you took when you took big steps out of your comfort zone like playing like 24 where all of a sudden you're like okay i'm on set for the first day or and maybe it wasn't 24 maybe there was building blocks up to that but i'm always curious of the first time i'm trying to teach my daughters that being uncomfortable is okay that it's good to be uncomfortable and do things that make you uncomfortable because then the more you get used to that then when you go on the set for night school by the way which we all watched and absolutely loved then <laughs> then uh well i lo liked it because she's dyslexic and so and kevin hart's character is dyslexic in it but when you go on the set of that it for you it's old hat it's it becomes very much your own your 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 territory where you own it so i'm curious i want to know everything i mean it's funny because before we got on the phone let me just flex a little i just made tacos and did laundry in the past like 10 minutes i'm like <laughs> put it in the zoom class and here we are but i was I think, I feel like I think about you in the equal opposite way. I'm like, how do you, how are you just outgoing? Like, how do you just go somewhere and hang out and have a good time? How do you do that? That's beyond me. I'm like, what is fun? How does fun happen? <laughs> my daughters um, asked the, my daughters asked the same question the other day. And I said, I think it's a, a derivation of my insecurities. I think that I was so nervous. We were talking about first t days going to school and I fucked it up so bad. I fucked that whole speech up so bad. But I explained to them, one of the things that made me, I, I was just, it's almost like, it's almost like I, my personality is almost like a zombie apocalypse and I'm the last one there and there's mm -hmm. no humans left. And I'm like, fuck it. I'll just run into the zombies and let them eat me. I, I'm done. I'm done. I'm not going to fight it anymore. Oh God. I mean, I... I feel like I'm the other. Well, no, I don't know. I don't want to be. I don't want to be what I was about to say, which is if it's the equal opposite, then I'm like, I just go interior and I'm like, goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> goodbye. Yeah, but but we there's all but there... fight and eat each other. I'm just gonna <laughs> eat leaves and berries and take it interior until I go back to that from which I came. <laughs> but but what's crazy is there's a part of you that like. I want to know about the high school you that thought I want to, I want to be on stage. I want, I want to find like, what were you like in high school? Um, honestly, it, 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 my perspective may change on this in a few years, the older I get. Cause now I'm kind of like stuff with my son where I'm like, maybe you're just like that. But what I always thought of, it, this is definitely a big part of it is that it was a survival mechanism in that I felt like I was imploding and I didn't know how to engage with people and so being on stage gave me that uh, attention that I craved, the, the validation. And maybe, I mean, that's, it's kind of a cliche thing for an actor to say, but like to ways to practice a, a, being a person and being like real within that, even though that's like a fake construct because I didn't feel comfortable doing that. And then as I went on to college, I went to school for painting because I didn't want to get a job and I didn't want to go to college. I really loved acting, but I didn't want to be around actors. I mean, that's a big part of my thing is just like, ugh, ugh, no. And then I tried to go for painting, but then I started having like, I think you might call it a life force inside of me, believe it or not, that was like, you got to get, you got to do something. Like I started to panic. And it came out of me. Maybe we're similar in that way. You just did it in a more fun loving way, but I did it through, I was doing performance art. And then I started making fun of performance art. And actually Patton was the one of the first people, I didn't meet him directly, but I saw him in San Francisco and I saw people at like these open mic poetry readings because the comedians, were, the clubs were starting to close. And so I was at, I was just like fascinated if someone was on a stage alone speaking, but I could have never entered into comedy with my personality. It's like, that doesn't even exist to me. Like a guy in a suit going, here's what I think about that. Like I still, 
Like I'm still working on my diction, you know, I'm still working on like not trailing off mid sentence or like looking down to the ground. Like, that's, so for me, can I tell you, <laughs> that's the thing that's like, that's the thing that engages me. Oddly enough, like your, your, your quirks and eccentricities are the things that draw me in. Like, you know, I, I remember falling in love with Vince Vaughn and being like, God, he's so good on interviews and the way he stutters and talks fast. And, and he, like, I wish I could do that. And then you're like, Oh no, you got to be yourself. And then the thing that you are is the thing that people like, you know, I yeah. guess, I don't know. Uh, thank you for saying that. And yeah, that, that is, it's those things that you can't help, but do, and you do them anyway. Cause there's almost a part of me performing not so much as an actor, but as a standup where it's like, and just generally speaking, it's like, you have no business doing that. Especially the early days, I had no, you know, because it was a lot of alt rooms, so you could get away with, because people aren't buying the ticket and they're, you know, it's more of like an arty uh, crowd. Um, and I would not know what I was going to say. And I would have maybe some bullet points or like a couple of words that I thought was funny were funny or maybe something that happened to me that day and I would get so nervous to go on stage like I wouldn't throw up I had a nicer way of doing it I would like fall I would get so tired I would like start to fall asleep because I was <laughs> out of nervousness my body would just shut down and I'm like I can't and I would use that and I think people were like uh, uh, like, is she going to be okay? And then when I, then when I said something that was coherent, that, 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 that was the release, you know, and it wasn't until years later and now where it's forming like the thoughts and the point of view and, you know, the areas. And I think, I mean, I don't mean to be uh, sad, but like, it was like a self-esteem thing. I didn't think I was allowed to like, take up space or say what I thought. And so the mechanism of performing, because I was inclined to that, it forces you to, to act in the moment. And the, the different layers of that, you know, now later in my life, because I'm not being like a total, like I'm saying abstract things. So now that I'm, you know, engaging with like, here's the topic and here's what I think about it. There's like another layer of not confrontation, but for me, you know, being so reactive, you know, I learned that because sometimes like the there's like a low stakes night at the improv years ago. I remember going like, well, how do you feel about that? And just like the opposite. I'm not that you shouldn't. But I did it with abandon, with no construct of where I was going to go or where I was standing. I just completely let people in to the point where I'm not, I'm not there anymore. And you can't do that when you're on stage where you're like, Oh, what, well, what do you think? And just like hand the reins over. So then it became a lesson in, in learning that. So it's been, you know, pure, pure joy doing stand up. <laughs> <laughs> did you, where did you go to college? Where did you go to art school? In Detroit. And then I finished. You grew up in Detroit, school. right? Yeah. South of Detroit in the suburbs down river. Near eight mile. <laughs> yeah, pretty much uh, on Eight Mile, on the streets. I know so little about Detroit. I and by the way, I love performing in Detroit. I love performing in Detroit. I was like the the crows, crow's foot. I think is that n just north of Detroit? Yeah, it's just outside of Detroit. It's it's. I think it's. I'm saying the right. That was like the first place I did where, like, uh, like more than un like I it was, that was the first like small theater I did. I think, and it was like oh, it's fucking awesome, and I. The sensibility, I love the sensibility of of just that Midwest area. I feel like I fit in. I feel like I'm, I feel like, you know, everyone's moving to Austin and Puerto Rico and Miami. And I go, I think I'd move to like the upper peninsula of Michigan. <laughs> yeah. I, I feel like, I feel like I've, I could have been a barnyard builder, you know? <laughs> isolation. Yeah. The isolation would be great for you. <laughs> Drink myself into a grave. Did you feel, were there, were, people i think people stereotype detroit and think it's one certain way did you what were what were people like growing up or that sounds so silly to say but was it as just as diverse as you see your son going to school in la or is it was it really like what was it like growing up in detroit oh i was from white bread whitey top town <laughs> my parents um that was white flight in 1971 when they moved to the suburbs 
Yeah. When I went to school, it was a little bit more mixed, but I didn't see, I mean, I didn't, I maybe knew a couple of black kids and maybe nobody gay, uh, one Jewish person. And that was just really exotic. (laughs) Really? (laughs) I mean, when I went to San Francisco was when I was around gay culture and that was like, amazing and like like uh you know i lived with the for a brief time with a bunch of women who were like we're strippers and we're proud of it and i was like oh what (laughs) that seems incongruous but i was like yeah man totally stripping and stuff acting like i was cool with it and i um i'm i'm all for that positive sex workers um now I get it, but but yeah, I, I did not grow up with anybody being cool with anything that was different. I remember, um, I, you know, I, I this is I'm you don't get a chance to work anything out on stage these days, so I'm working them all out on podcasts. So if this comes off super insensitive, I apologize, everybody. <laughs> Hit it, go work out all your material. <laughs> the beauty of ignorance is the awakening when you're ignorant. Like when you don't know any gay people and then you meet gay people for the first time and you realize they fall in love just identically (laughs) as straight people. And you have this moment where you're like, oh, my God, you're just as annoying as when my roommate fell in love in college. Like this is gross to be around. It's someone else is in love. I don't have it. You have it. I'm fucking jealous. There's no I thought like I live with two lesbians and I thought they would be wrestling in sports bras and and like and it was just a fucking relationship. And I remember laying in bed going, oh, this is just as annoying as when Blair met Shannon, my buddy in college. You know, this is just as annoying. It's a couple falling in love. And when you're on the outside being the roommate, there's no like it, it was a real eye opening. You know. All of all, my whole experience in New I York. I love that. That's through. where you take it to. You're like, I'm left out. <laughs> the whole every time I've never been the person where someone was like at a party and they're like, you know, Brenda's single. You know, who we should introduce her to Bert. <laughs> and I always sat there and listened and go, you know, who we should introduce him to Tony. I know he's out of the country for three years, but if she meets him, she'll fall in love. And I'm sitting right there going the fuck about me. Like, God. But but it's it's cool. When did you? How old were you when you moved to San Francisco? I was twenty, early twenties, twenty three, maybe twenty four, and then I came to LA when I was like twenty six. By yourself? Um, y- no, I went to San Francisco with my roommate, or not my roommate, a friend of mine from Michigan that I went to college with, because I didn't think I could was allowed to leave Mich- Michigan. Like I just didn't think that was allowed. And then she said, "I'm going there for a semester." through our school. So I, again, I had this, like, just in the pit of my soul was like, you're, I want to do that. I'm like, but really underneath that was like, get the fuck out of here and don't come back. And then that's what happened. But I, I, I made it okay to go for a semester. And then it, then in San Francisco, it was driving to LA to do live shows. And I had finished art school and I was like, yeah, man, I'm done with the scene. And like would drive to LA. We're doing live shows, like no reason. You know what I mean? No job, no money. It was just, yeah, I want to go do shows in LA. And it was the best. God, who did you, who were you, who was in the scene at that time? I'm trying to think that is, I think we're the same age. I think you're younger than me actually. But, um, is that, that's 97. Yeah. Maybe like, yeah, 97. I was going to say 95, 96, 97. Yeah. David Cross, Bob Odenkirk, Blaine Capatch, Will Ferrell, Greg Barrett, Kathy Griffin, Janine Garofalo, uh, Molly Shannon. There was a whole group that went on to SNL. Jack Black, um, Julia Sweeney. God, I remember you, you guys were so in stride when I first came out to L.A. You guys were destructive when I came. There was no. Really? That was the scene. That was the only scene was you guys. Yeah. Like that there was there like I, now that the store, I think everyone says there's like bro comics or whatever, but that I don't remember one of them. I know I didn't meet one comic when I came out. I, I think they were all, probably all working the door at the store at the time, but I remember seeing. Oh my God. We, I never went to the store. I mean, that's not true. I had an anomaly was I had a 
I did an open mic in the belly room for a while, like ran the show, but we never went there to like, well, those were the dead years too. Yeah. No one went there. I mean, I, I, I never even thought that the, I, I never, I went to the store maybe a couple times because of Louis Anderson, he brought me over there and I, and I worked there, but I never got passed by, uh, where'd you meet Louis Anderson? Um, Barry Katz introduced me to Louis and it was like Louis Anderson was the first famous person phone call I ever got. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Well, actually I take that back. Elliot Gould was the first famous person, <laughs> but let me rephrase that. Will Smith was the first one, then Elliot Gould, then, then, but it was, I still was excited. Like I remember getting a call from Louis. I was on the four Oh five driving, uh, North coming up over, uh, um, Getty up where the, where the Getty is. And, uh, and Louis Anderson called me and I was like, I was like, I'll oh, play it cool. And he was like, ah, whatever he sounds like. But he was like, you want to, I'm doing Sunday nights at the store. Barry says you're funny. And so I did Sunday night with him and, and I started doing Sunday nights with him and they were sold out. I met Roseanne there. I remember Chris Rock was backstage one time. I remember one time it was me, Steve Byrne, Chris Rock, Andrew Dice Clay. What? I was like, and Roseanne, like it was fucking everyone was there. Everyone was there. In the main room. In the main room. How did you deal with that? Just, you just took it in stride? Going, yeah. Yeah, me, me, Gary Goldman, and Steve Byrne were sitting back there, and we would, uh, we were just like, I remember we said to Chris Rock, we're like, hey, man, how did you get feature work? Like, how did you get his, on the road as a feature? And he looked at us, and he was like, are you guys, is that your goal? And we were like, yeah, right now. And he was like, the goal is to be a headliner. So fuck being a feature, be a headliner. And we were like, oh, great. Thanks. Thanks for the advice, Chris. And we just walked away. We're like, we're still trying to get like 600 bucks a week over in Omaha. Like, but uh, Andrew Dice Clay told the funniest story I've ever heard in my life and had everyone, Chris, I mean, everyone in the back rolling, crying, laughing. And then he went on stage and he was like, uh, hickory dickory duck. And all of us were in the, in the main room going like, why didn't you just tell the stage you just, the story you just told us backstage, you should have told on stage. But it was this like, I think at the time he was going through a little bit of a transition on, you know, at the time. But. It, yeah. Do, I mean, does he, did he, I don't really i've met him recently D did he move through that and did he start talking yes. and okay yeah he's now he is i mean he's i i think and i think andrew dice clay is brilliant he's like you know obviously one of the the first guy that in high school that we were quoting him and sam kinnison are like my two of my heroes but yeah he's transitioned out and he's doing the stuff about that stuff and i think you know i think everyone god damn it what the fuck is this dog do you hear that dog yeah i like it mac i want to know what's going on Mac, Izzy, come here. They're, uh, oh, it's Izzy. Oh, no, it's Mac. Come here. Hey, calm down, okay? I have two bull mastiffs, and they are freaking lunatics. Damn, girl. Yeah, one, they're both really pretty dogs. Uh, but yeah, I, you know, I never went to the store. I might, what I enjoyed was what was going on at the improv with, like, at the time, I think it was all you guys. And like, I remember Zach was like the closest I knew to like a New York comic because he had started in New York and, uh, and I'd met him in New York, but that was like the improv. I remember just, I remember I, I, the hardest, one of the hardest I've ever laughed was, and I've told you this a million times was that character you did of the promo girl. Do you remember that? No. And I don't remember you telling me I've, I have personal problems. It's my, it is at What's the time. The promo I was, pro, so promo girls were, um. Promo Girls, I worked on a show called The X Show on FX. Oh, it's just me acting it out? I remember that. And you were and you played a model, like a, a like a, a a promo model. So we used to call them promo models and they would like just walk up and they'd be like, Hi, check out my website. <laughs> you know, like and it was like trying to drive traffic oh, to their yeah, website. Yeah. And it was so accurate. It was so accurate and so niched because there were because I, I i all i did was work with these women that's all i did i i, I don't she i she doesn't it I, cindy margolis i was like she, it doesn't matter if i say it. that was <laughs> that's such a weird you just dug that out of my memory i spent probably six months 
stuffing my boobs. I think I secretly just wanted to dress like that. And I, I would do it on stage, not in the costume, but I would do it full on with the wig and the lipstick and like short shorts. And just because it was so not like me, it was just like, it was the best. It was hilarious. I saw, <laughs> I, I was with Gary Valentine and we were in, I forget the name of the theater, but it was Zach. It was when Zach was dressed. It Zach did. It was a big, pro, a big uh, event, and like Sarah went on, uh, Patton went on, Zach went on dressed as Little Orphan Annie, um, and you did the the I call it the promo girl, but and I I was, was I was crying laughing, and I, immediately then I was like I gotta find out who this fucking chick is, and then all of a sudden you just started popping up and everything I was see I was like hey, hey there she is, and uh, yeah. I think I went up to you at the end of that night and was like, that is the funniest. And you were very deflective. You're like, oh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And just walked away. And I was like, I was like, oh, that she's not even remotely close to that human being that I just saw on stage. Like that is a different. Yeah. Totally. I was probably embarrassed that I even did it. Yeah. So good. It was we have so a, We have an interesting uh, intersection of that, that time in LA. How did you, how were you not intimidated to go on in the main room during those shows where it's sold out? Um, I, you know, I, I'm, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I would, I have theories. I have theories. I, you know, when I watched I was young, your brain go for that answer and it wasn't there. Well, I have the answer, but it, it sounds weird. So I, when I was young, um, Everyone used to everyone used to say about me, man, put Bert in under pressure and that's when he performs. I didn't okay. think I didn't think it was real. I really honestly never thought it was real. I just was like that's something they say to all kids. But for whatever reason in sports growing up, I I always enjoyed and and, and I think it's one of those things like make yourself uncomfortable and then the every time you get into uncomfortable situations, the more comfortable comfortable you'll be. I think my dad, it was like brainwashing my dad did, where he would say to me, if it's a pressure situation, that's when Bert excels. And I started believing that. And then in pressure situations, I would actually hear myself say, say to myself, this is when you're going to do great. Like then, and, and I remember very distinctly uh, just one moment where we were playing a baseball game in high school. And I was a very, like, I was very competitive baseball player give me a second i gotta shut this dog up this podcast is brought to you by skylight frames i absolutely love our skylight frames we were given them uh, as gifts from the company and then we immediately decided to give them as gifts to our family my mom my dad my sisters our best friends we gave them to our best friends here's what's beautiful about skylight frames it's a beautiful 10 inch screen super easy to use the setup my wife set it up. I don't mean that disparaging to either my wife, but it's great. You throw it in, and then all you do is when you get pictures, you email it to this email address, and then they go right up. It's a great way to stay in touch with your parents. That's what we're doing with my parents. That's what we do with my wife's parents. We get, gave it to my wife's dad. My wife's dad set it up. Check out my wife's podcast with her dad, and you'll understand how easy this is set up. Um, super amazing. Uh, I love Skylight Frames. Right now, there's a holiday offer. If you can, you can get ten dollars off your purchase of a skylight frame when you go to skylightframes.com and enter the code BERT. That is ten dollars off your purchase if you go to Skylight Frames and enter the code BERT. That's S K Y L I G H T F R A M E dot com slash BERT. Skylightframe.com and enter the code BERT. This podcast is brought to you by Noom. Let's talk about getting healthy. Think about everything you've ever learned about health. God damn it, there's contradictions. Everything that you learn, the old fashioned food pyramid, they aren't helpful. You need to rebrand your brain when it comes to eating and Noom is so helpful. It's an app I have on my phone that I go to constantly. I put in the food I eat. It teaches you about understanding your cravings and knowing how to shop, knowing how food is sometimes bad, having, more energy, uh, understanding your exercise again, and fitting better in clothes. It helps you feel good about your choices. I ate an apple today. You know why I ate an apple? Because Noom taught me to eat apples. I would never eat an apple normally. I just have a, I'd have a bag of Doritos because that's what I crave. But I just know that Noom taught me how to eat an apple. 
It's super easy. It takes 10 minutes a day. Noom works with your lifestyle, so you don't have to commit to a rigorous plan. You just go in, log in your food, teaches you how to eat. I love it. I love it more than, it's more of like a cognitive behavioral thing. There's the science of getting healthier and it's called Noom. Trust me, I've used it. I don't use it perfectly, but if you use it perfectly, you, you will get healthier. You will you lose weight. Here's the deal. Learn how to eat again with Noom. Sign up for your trial today at Noom.com slash Burkcast. It's Noom, N-O-O-M dot com slash Burkcast. Ready to learn how to live healthier? Sign up at Noom today at Noom.com, N-O-O-M dot com slash Burkcast. I remember distinctly one time in high school where uh, the coach told me it was a baseball game we were playing against Plant. And he was like, this is, this is where it counts. This is what you strive for. It's, it's still, it's silly. I, so much of everything in my life goes back to sports. Cause I think it's such, it's such a quantifiable talent. Like you, you can so wrap your head around whether or not you're doing good or bad. Yeah. Um, and I remember hitting a triple and I, and I remember getting in there and feeling like I had superhuman powers. Like this is where I excel. This is the moment my dad's been talking about. This is what I do. I when it when it's pre when there's a pressure situation, I can perform. And I I literally translated that to stand up. And I to the point when I got to be dead honest with you. When I was when I got my first deal, I was a horrific comedian. I was a I was the worst comedian. But what I could do is my energy would get up. And for some reason, I could have a dream set with very little material that seemed organic and real and and scripted and and good things would happen. I I also think I'm very lucky, but but I I I mean I, I remember my first six months of stand up. I only had two good sets. Two. One was in front of this guy named David Tochterman, who ran Will Smith's company, and the other one was on Caroline's uh to make a tape for Will Smith to see. The two good sets. The only two good sets I had in the entire. I, at all and and then in moments like like doing the store with it sold out i think that i think that that brainwashing my dad did to me kind of just said to me this is what this is what we look forward to um i had i did i'll give perfect 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 example i did uh my first netflix special secret time and i bombed on the first show i just doing two shows and i bombed i mean bombed like how is that even possible? Uh, Were you just like trying to say the words right in the right order? Uh, no, I was. I was just flub a line here or flub a line there, and it's so under a microscope when you're doing a special. And then one of the things I told my my producers, a kid I grew up with, it was a man I grew up with, um, Tony Hernandez, and I had told him. He he said, "How do you bomb?" I said, "Dude, sometimes the planets align, and it just isn't your moment." And I said, Tony, I did. I bombed once in Australia in the Sydney Royal Opera House or whatever, the big thing, you know, the one on the water. Yeah. I, I went to tell a joke, and as I told the joke, I stepped on the microphone cord, and as I, as I went to tell the joke, the mic pulled away from my mouth, and no one heard the punchline. <laughs> and I, I told him about that, and that happened on that show. And Tony was like, it happened again. And then the next show, I knew I had one show to get this spot to do to do well and i just and i was like i was like this is this is what my dad talked about i love pressure i love for whatever i love pressure it makes me makes me feel good and I, it makes me perform I, I if without pressure i feel like there's no stakes in it so um and so i, I think that to, to make a very 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 long story out of it i would go into those rooms and then i would I just was, I was on, I had, I, I did it like for five weeks and I had monster sets, like so good that it was like, you know, we don't have any of those again. And then you're just like, well, I'll just ride that wave until maybe I figure out how to write a joke. I mean, I was such a bad comic. You have no idea. I, to this day, I think, I think I'm like, God, I wish I could just, I wish we didn't have to write new hours all the time. <laughs> What, so you would go to like open mic, like little rooms and just struggle and bomb. And then you would go to sold out rooms and crush. Just Horrifically. Yeah. Energy. So yeah, I would, and I, I don't, I'm not certain why, but like, uh, I was very, I, I, I would go every weekend when I was in New York every week, I would go to surf reality, uh, uh, collective unconscious and I would do spots there and I would just bomb. I would bomb so bad. 
and and then at the Boston, I'd worked the Boston, and I just never did well. I mean, I could I could cheat code it, you know, but I I just never did well. And then for whatever reason, when I when there was a big opportunity, I I, I would just be better. I would be a lot better. I'd get a lot of the bull. I stopped cursing as much. I get a lot of the bullshit out of my act, and I dial in. And then and then when I started doing the road, that's when I found my voice. I, once I did the road. Then all of a sudden I was like, this is the greatest thing in the world. This is better than anything in LA, anything in New York. And I, I miss that. I'm genuinely miss that time. I remember yeah. when you were, I remember talking to you about going and doing the road. I remember, yeah. I remember reaching out, I think to Colleen, cause she was a big fan of yours. And I was like, you know, she's a comic like Colleen in, in Omaha. I was like, you have to have her in. She was like, no way. I go, she's fucking hilarious. You got to bring her in. And she was like, are you, I mean, so many people were such fans of yours. And I'd be like, you got to reach out. You got to reach out. But the you know the road is the roads. There are people like you saying that about me. I love that. Like Bobby Lee did that to me. You you don't know. I was at the store when I wasn't at the store. He was telling Tommy that, that whatever. That's just a funny moment of like, and he's like, no, I don't think so. But my first run of clubs was at Side Splitter Tampa. The owner was like, oh. Oh my God, like you're, you're, you sold out every show. Well, this was when 24 was still on the air. Now I had my act, like my, a real, my act was ready. But when I did that show, the shows went great. They went fine. First of all, the other comedians before me were super hype. You know, this is going to be great. And then they would come off stage and be like, that was weird. And then when I got on stage, it was so palpable, like people could not get past. They just wanted to see me from 24. And if you, what you described of me personally, you know, my comedy came from that place of like, I don't know, like I'm uncomfortable or whatever. And like, you cannot do that when people are seeing you as a superstar from television. Like there were so many things wrong with that scenario. I could not do my act. I could not have that self-deprecating attitude and also, like, people don't want to hear about the stuff that I actually talk about because they're just, like, they cannot help themselves. Like, where's Jack Bauer? And, like, they, because they were, you know, especially at that time, because it was, like, right at the pinnacle of the show or, like, it was right at the end of it. And I I had to, I developed a whole 15, 20 minutes. Sometimes half of my act was, like, you're my Jack Bauer, sir. You know, just, like crowd work of letting them having breaking them down from that energy like let's talk about it and I would do it until I got them into a place where I could turn a corner and then when I started talking about what I want to talk about they were like uh -huh. and then they left you know like like what what was that so uh yeah it's really interesting to, and I've had people like couples like super dressed up and then but then they get to like the laughing skull and they're like oh like they think I'm gonna be at a stadium and I'm like nope or audiences that are half and half like who does she think she is like my audience fighting with each other because then the other one's like um you don't know who she is and I'm like you guys figure it out I just want to do some comedy here but um what a fascinating recipe like the real strange brew. <laughs> I mean, it really is like, you know, Rogan dealt with that because people were like, he's the fear factor guy. Oh, yeah. And he was like, no, I'm a comedian. And they were like, you do fear factor. Eat a bug. You know, <laughs> I remember I remember being with Bam Margera and Ryan Dunn um, in a in a theme park. Uh, we were it was a very long story, but Ryan Dunn and I were trying out for the same role of this birth conqueror. It was a show I ended up becoming. And I remember they would yell to Bam and Ryan, do jackass. And I was like, they just want them to punch each other in the head. Like, and I was, I remember being like, what does do jackass means? And they were like, I, they yelled, do jackass. They're like jackass and hit him. And they're like, that's what oh, they want. They, they, they just want to see that. And then they're happy. They want to just see Bam slap Ryan in the face. And I was like, that's fucking odd. Like that fame would get so far in front of you that, that it's crazy and, and 24 was massive yeah what's that what's that feel like what i want to know everything about that and i, I don't I, not to like harp on that tv show but like and i wasn't even the biggest fan of it but it 
it I, it was so big it was so big and you booked it just as a pot did you guys know it was going to be hot when you booked it no i booked it three years in it was already i was oh, really I on season three it was already like off the charts super popular show so i was nervous going into it i mean it was the first set that it felt like a movie set like you know how on sitcoms it'd be like the laughers and the producers. And this was like, no one was there. And you run through the scene with the director. And I was really nervous to fit in on that show. Um, it was weird. Cause I kind of like knew I could do it, but I also was like, uh Oh, and, and I would get backhanded compliments from the execs. Like we didn't know you could do drama and you know, like I fucked up early on. Like I thought, Oh, I got this. And I was like, Oh no, I, I don't got this actually. Like I, cause I don't really like to study. So I would just, you know, yeah, I got these lines and then they would go relight and I'm like, uh, it's gone. Like it is gone from my head. Like I had to learn how to be that kind of an actor saying those types of words, but, uh, Oh yeah. Right from the get go, the show is super popular. It took me a while because I knew I did stand out, which was part of what made me popular on that show. But initially people were like, oh, that character is so annoying because I was like a computer tech and like kind of a busybody. And I was like, I am like one episode. They gave me someone's baby to like put under the desk. I mean, that show is it's so dramatic. I'm like, oh, I'm, I am like, you know, just the the goofy part. Like I'm not I'll do my four episode arc and this will be over. And then they started writing me that I was helping Jack Bauer. So then my character had this whole other layer to it. So it started, then it was like, wait, she's annoying, but she's like his right-hand man, but she's the only person that can help him with this thing, or she's the only person he can trust. And then they like loved me. And it was, I mean, it was crazy, like how successful it was. It was, it was a lot. It was, it was major. Was there, um, what was, what was the money like? Was it when you like? I know how I you hear You're like, stories. I know always, how money works, but what was it like for you? No, no, but like you always hear stories. Like I remember hearing Rogan and Dane talk about what was the first thing. Like men always buy cars and and you know oh, I got a I got a deprivation tank or or you know I bought a mansion. I, this sounds silly, but like I always wonder when I worked with Kathy Griffin, I was like, what like what what's the are women more level-headed when they get money and they go i'm gonna invest a little and i'm gonna buy some property no, they're or... not more in my case i am not more level-headed and i didn't make as much money so that's cool <laughs> <laughs> um yeah i started a woman's commune is what i did and bought like a six thousand square foot house and i was like i'm never gonna make less money than this like this is my base level like i'm good <laughs> That would have been the time to invest right about that time. But <laughs> made that choice. Did uh did you can did you did you go to like Comic Cons and stuff? A little bit. I remember one, this was before the San Diego one was as popular. I mean, it was just right before it got major, major popular. And I remember it was the only one I did with Kiefer, and I think we had so there was maybe like four of us and they had to do like a, we had to do like a human to hold on to each other and they had to part the crowd. And it was, it was pretty interesting. And like, we had to hide on the loading deck. Like we couldn't even go in the building. And uh, that was the height of it. One time I had a woman say to me, this is off topic, but on in that, how insane the fans are. She said, Oh, I can't believe like they gave Kiefer that DUI. They need to change those laws. Like he didn't deserve that. I was like, okay. One time at a show, a woman told me that she slept with a Jack Bauer doll, but she said it in a way that she needed me to know because I would understand. And, you know, that's scary. And that's like really embarrassing. And like you want to like laugh at somebody. But in those moments, I needed, I felt like, oh boy, like she is fragile and I, and I have to stand there and be subject to her telling me about her Jack Bauer doll. And I was like, uh-huh. 
Like if I, I don't want to be the thing that like pushes her over and she's done for, I, I have to like keep this going for her. Like it's a big deal that she's meeting me and telling me that she has a Jack Bauer doll that she sleeps next to. And I have to support her in that. Uh, weird, right? Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. That's, I mean, I don't know. Kiefer Sutherland is such a, uh, it's just, he's like, you know, he's, there's those people that kind of got birthrighted into our, into our psyche, you know, where like, like, yeah. I feel like I remember when it happened for Ben, Ben Affleck and, uh, Matt Damon. Like, I remember, I remember when that, when I was like, so, so these will be our new movie stars. Cool. Like, I remember that. And then being like, yeah. and almost like America being like, yeah, we're cool with that. Like, oh, cool. He's dating Winona Ryder. Oh, neat. Like, you know, like it was almost like, it was almost like being knighted, but Kiefer Sutherland is like, I mean, we're talking young guns, fucking lost boys. Unreal. I mean, dude, the. I'm not saying I agree with that lady with, about uh, the DUI rules, but I mean, I kind of, if it's Kiefer. <laughs> yeah. Was there a moment with uh, Ben Affleck? What's that? When they won for best screenplay, when everyone was like, they didn't write that with um, Good yeah. Will Hunting. Was that the, yeah. like people were. I remember people were like, they, they, they didn't write that. That was screenwriters that wrote it. They, they had the idea. They came up with the idea yeah. of two buddies in Boston. Of course, they're from Boston. I remember all of that. I lived in the house next door to the one they quote unquote wrote it in. And then I would hear the people that owned it be like, they didn't write it. They didn't write it. And you're like, oh, whatever. It was a great fucking movie. I know. Isn't that funny? Like, I, I get, you know, I, this is, I, this is where I'm at a little bit with, um, this is crazy. And I'm certain this probably really re re relates to religion or at least faith, but like, I don't, I don't, I'm cool with being lied to. I don't, I don't need to know everything. I don't, I want to just oh. want it to be good. I just want it to be good. Like, uh, like, the, I love that. Like lie, lie to me. <laughs> yeah. I was sitting on, I was on the treadmill today thinking about it. And I was like, um, I have, I actually have foregone cancel culture, meaning I don't buy into it. So like when, well, I don't really know what happened with Bruce Springsteen. I guess he did a Super Bowl commercial that was out of touch or, or tone deaf or whatever. And then he got a DUI. And I actually see the news comes up in my news feed and I just scroll past it and I go, ah, I don't want to cancel him. I don't, I don't want to care. And I just go, I like Bruce Springsteen and I just flip yeah, past yeah. it. And, and so when it can, when it comes to things like, like I refuse to hear bad news about Ben Affleck. I, I like that guy. I like him a lot. And I want him to, I know he's an alcoholic. I know he's got issues. I, I certain of it. I just want to see that picture of him with the paparazzi where he's holding the Dunkin' Donuts and the two coffees and he's jumbling. And I'm like, that's my Ben Affleck. He's just got his iced coffee. He's just doing the best he can, you know? My 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 favorite picture of him ever, and I know this isn't the one he wants to be brought up, <laughs> is him in the back of a fucking Range Rover chugging Jack in the Box before he goes to rehab. <laughs> like I, first of all, it makes me, love jennifer garner like i love jennifer garner gets a pass in the universe for in perpetuity what, for putting up with him yeah just for being a badass motherfucker who's like all right let's go let's go sweep up my husband let's go my ex-husband's in, in the fucking shit that's the father of my children let's go pour him into the back seat let's take him to rehab we love him he's here i'm listen he's done some i guarantee you he has run that woman's heart through the ringer i was yeah. there can i this is uh, maybe how psychotic I am. I was there when they fell in love, meaning I watched dinner part dinner for five with John Favreau when she was on with him and and Kevin Smith, and you could mm -hmm. tell she was pining for him. You could tell that she was in love with him and she was going to get her man. Like you could tell it. So I feel like I've been in that relationship since day one. And I've been green. I've been, as my daughters say, I've been shipping it since day one. <laughs> she might be an angel. Yeah. Cause now I, I, every once in a blue moon, I'll see her on social. Like I'm making bagels. It's 4am <laughs> for my kids. Guys. Oh, 
oh, the water's bubbling. Like she might be <laughs> hey, an angel. I'm making sunflower seeds. They're a little premature, but we're going to make them. And I'm sitting there going, <laughs> shut <laughs> up. I go, sunflower seeds come out of sunflowers? I never <laughs> fucking knew that. <laughs> She's like, no big deal. Like, you know how hard it is to make bagels? She's up, like, kneading dough at 4 a.m. Like, what the fuck is wrong with you? It's interesting because I feel like someone who makes me laugh just as much as anyone is Kevin Hart. And I feel like he's not, he they, so, for whatever reason, he snags on everyone. Like, everyone wants to take him down. And I, and I, and I, and I think, I really honestly think Kevin Hart, is one of the funniest human beings alive. Like, and you know him, you've worked in, Dude, with him. He, it was like nonstop giggling. Once you get in that vortex where he's talking to you and then like doing bits for you, but then talking to you, I mean, like so silly and so, so funny. I have uh, one simple theory. Uh, it's called a little bit overexposed. That's all. That's interesting. I. I, um, I have a fear about that too. Stand up specials. There's nothing more delightful. There's nothing more delightful. He's so good at taking a character. You know, he changed a lot of the way I did stand up. I watched him on Shaquille O'Neal and uh, and and Cedric Entertainer's All Star Comedy, and everyone was going out trying to play to the crowd, and he just did his act. And I went, "Oh, that's right. If you write a great act, you can just also do that." And you and he just did his act. I mean, yeah. he is so, but overexposure. Well, he has talked about himself. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, 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 no. You say it. You say He's it He's talked about himself early on of like um, people just going, what are you doing? Like he just sort of didn't really ha have it at the beginning, like making fun of himself for how bad he was, but then also having the instincts enough to just do what he does until he got better at what he does. Like he never let it bother him what other people were saying. And I don't, and I don't mean to say like, Oh, his, spe his old specials are good. Like, I think he's great. I just think there's a little bit, a lot all the time, everywhere. And in, in so many different things. Um, but I think he's awesome. It's in overexposure um, is a fascinating insight because I feel like people do start rolling their eyes at you when they see you everywhere and they go fucking enough like jesus christ and then and then or overexposure uh, so i have two theories about cancel culture meaning not not like legit cancel like i i th i'm talking about when when the wolves come after you and are on your heels and you can get away with it you're gonna be fine but but when the wolves come after you and i feel like I, i've been thinking about this a lot and when you say overexposure i go there's certain things Number one, I watched the Patrice documentary, and Patrice in the documentary said the reason Pee Wee Herman got in trouble, and this is the reason he didn't want to do his VH1 show, was that Pee Wee, Pee -wee Herman was a jerk-off in a movie theater type of guy playing for kids. And he goes, Patrice is like, I'm a jerk-off in a movie theater kind of guy, and I need jerk-off in a movie theater type of fans to follow <laughs> with me. <laughs> and it's just such a true, like, if you can be true to who you are, meaning, and brand is the wrong word, but true to who you are across the board that's why you know people i'm sure are upset about olivia wilde and and harry styles because they're like you know i thought you were in love i thought what happened we we shipped it with you and jay's i'm saying keep saying ship it but like <laughs> and so like if i always say tom and i always say if i ever cheated on my wife my career's over because everyone knows i love my wife i love my wife that's i love my kids yeah, like, i talk shit about my kids i say horrible with things our idea them. of who you are yeah and if, then yeah. And, yeah, and it's like, and so all of a sudden, if I start doing videos where you see me, you know, uh, getting lean and ripped, everyone's like, wait, what the fuck happened to Bert? And then they start going, hold on, was he lying to us? You know, no, I'm not saying I can't get in shape, but like, if I, if all of a sudden I just change, I just pivot entirely and I'm like, hey guys, thanks for all partying with me and having a good time and believing that I was this party guy who robbed trains with the Mo Russian mafia. But in real life, I just wanted to be a movie star and I'm getting ripped. I'm getting hair transplants. I'm going to become something. I think people start going, that's not who we fell in love with. Like I remember being upset when Chris Farley wouldn't do roles that I wanted to see Chris Farley in meaning. And I'm so unhealthy, but I was like, or like John Belushi when he did continental divide, I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. Where's Bluto Bartowski? Like that's who I want. 
And so I feel like that, but overexposure is a fucking fascinating aspect of it because yeah, you're right. Too, too much of it. And, and all of a sudden everyone's like, well, that's not what happened to Dave Matthews. <laughs> was there, really oh yeah i mean dude dave matthews like and i'm not like i'm really outing myself as a meathead but dave matthews <laughs> was fucking awesome okay why how is he over maybe i'm like really because he's dead to me like i could care less about <laughs> dave matthews no. he's underexposed and will always be underexposed in my heart and my soul and my loins. He's so good. He and is so asshole. good. I he saw him live. cannot even pass through my asshole, Dave Matthews. <laughs> I saw him live two years ago. He is so good. He is so good. But he was, he got so overexposed when, like, when we were in college, we went and saw him at this place called the Milk Bar, and he was oh, amazing. I know what you're talking amazing. about. Amazing. And then all of a sudden, he starts, he becomes, everyone starts liking him, and then the people that were his... Yeah jerk off in the movie theater people with him all of a sudden we're like we're like fuck i'm out i want i'm gonna listen to fish or or g love and special sauce or or the <laughs> cowboy junkies or whatever you know like whatever fucking random references i can come up with but i feel like overexposure is very fascinating to find the right amount of exposure where you go i'm gonna just sit in the cut i don't need all the limelight but what a fucking great cast you guys you were a part of i mean in, the, uh, night school I mean, what a fucking... Oh, we, we're you talking about? I have so many credits. Which no, yeah, about. night school. Rob Riggle. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, the best. Are you kidding me? The best. Romney. Um, Tiffany. Uh, I mean, all of it was like just fucking... It was a great movie. Thank you. I'm glad you enjoyed it. We had a blast. I think it just... I don't know. People enjoyed it. It just got really tanked with like critics. I oh, mean, it did? one of those big... Oh God, my dog is doing the opposite of your dogs. Just full belly up, leaning oh. against the door. Um, Wait, did it? I because I I don't have a frame of reference for how things do. Like I know that if I I watch it and I like it, then I it go. It did oh, that was really really well, but it it people were like critics just panned it. Um, that's silly. It was a good movie. We watched it with the family. This podcast is brought to you by HelloFresh. What is HelloFresh? Well, you get fresh, pre-measured ingredients with mouth-watering seasonal recipes delivered right to your door. Skip trips to the grocery store and count on HelloFresh to make home cooking easy and affordable. And that is why it is America's number one meal delivery kit. It's so great. It cuts out all those stressful trips to the grocery store because these are fresh ingredients delivered right to your door. Here's what I love about HelloFresh is I get the opportunity to make dinner for my family, sit down with my family, eat dinner with my family, and it's stuff they wouldn't normally try. And here's what's great. Super easy to make, super easy to cook, super easy to get on the table. And so when you come home and you're after a big day, you don't have to run to the grocery store. All the ingredients are there in your fridge. You grab a bag, you go brought it out. We're eating the HelloFresh, you chop it up. Everyone tries something they would never normally try because that's my kids, you know? And uh, and then we have a great dinner and we end up talking. That's what's beautiful. You sit down with your kids and have dinner and you end up talking. Now listen, if you're a dude and you're single, buy a couple of these and ask some chicks on a date. Damn, why wouldn't you do that? Here's the deal. Go to HelloFresh.com slash BurtCast12 and use the code BurtCast12 for 12 free meals, including free shipping. That is HelloFresh.com slash BirdCast12. And use the code BirdCast12 for 12 free meals. That's a lot of meals. It's America's number one meal kit. That's HelloFresh.com slash BirdCast12. Can, can you tell when you're making something if you're like, oh, this is going to be a stinker? Or... I loved all those the actors that were in it and we were having such a good time and i knew it was like a big broad comedy which i had never done before but i you know i was like oh this is it i get to be in big broad comedy movies now and it's like no that was not the case like that was one and done and 
And I don't, I think they tried to please everybody a bit because that's the style of movie it was, but that they're really, really funny things within it. Um, and it, yeah. And it kind of felt like that when we were making it, like we were making each other laugh and super enjoyable, but you know, who knows? Cause it's a little bit like sappy and broad. Do you, what, what, what do you like? What do you enjoy the most out of all the things in Hollywood? Like if they said, Hey, you only get to do one. What would you like? Would you, would you do television? Would you do movies? Would you do a straight multicam? Would you do, uh, would you just do stand up? Would you ju- like, where, where, where would you be the happiest? I mean, I don't really know. I guess the dream for a long time was to get that sitcom and have those hours and have family hours, but still be do the, doing the comedy and be in front of a live audience and have that type of thing where, where they change the lines at the last minute and you get to find the beats and you get to have a character and you, you know, you get to come in and have breakfast at work and, you know, you're like, oh, network runs through at two and then you're done for the day. And, and also you make a big ass fat paycheck and then you just make the syndication money. But, uh, <laughs> you know, by the way, you're selling it so good right now. I've wanted Ooh. multi-cam my whole career, my whole career. I've been wanted to do a multi-cam. And it just, I guess they're, I don't know if they're working that well right now. I know Fluffy's got a great one. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, Billy Gardell seems to hit it out of the park with them. But for That's whatever, awesome. I think for my fan base and for what I do, I don't think, I guess multicam hasn't been in the cards. Yeah. No, I, I, I think my time is, is over for that. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it's funny. Cause like when you talk to me about my personality on stage and your perception of me and like who I would really want to be, like, I would wish I was Patrice O'Neill. You know what I mean? Like, I wish I was the polar opposite of what I actually am, but you gotta just use your, you gotta use your gifts, man. You know? <laughs> yeah. Or like immediately I was like dogging on Dave Matthews and then immediately in my head afterwards, I'm like, no, but he's, no, he's really good. Like he's got that really good. Like I'm so oh. don't want to be, say anything bad about anyone, but it feels so good to just be like, I wouldn't even shit him out my asshole. Like I, it feels great. I left my friend a message the other day and I was like, blah, 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 blah. And I was talking about somebody that I had a fight with and I was like, he, he's dead to me. And she called, she's like, I love hearing you say like, he's dead to me. <laughs> I, was like, I meant it, but like, I couldn't say it, you know, I'm like, you're dead to me. Like the most gentle, <laughs> but you know, I'm also, I'm sorry. And I'm also sorry. And if we could just, you know, uh, you could also live with me if you need to, if you need to, you want to borrow my car, you're dead to me. You need to borrow my car. Go ahead. <laughs> I wish there was like, it feels so good to like trash it to like, to feel that confident and just go like, <laughs> fuck that guy piece of shit. And then, and then all of a sudden, all of a sudden they call you and they're like, Hey man, what, what did I do to you? And you're like, Oh, you didn't, I didn't know you were listening. Like, oh my God, who did I just, um, what's his name? Um, what's the guy who directed Almost Famous? Cameron Crow. Cameron Crow. I ca- I kept thinking Russell Crow. I couldn't think of his name. Cameron Crow. Um, so back I was trying to be like opinionated on Twitter, you know, and I was trying to be like throw out something like lightly provocative and just I was like, yeah, I don't I don't even think I made a joke out of it. I just like disparaged who, probably rightfully so, but we bought a zoo. Is that what that movie's called? I'm like, yeah, <laughs> the gist of it was just like, yeah, I have no desire to see that. He tweeted me <laughs> back directly. He goes, I'm sorry to hear that, Mary Lynn. And I was like, no, 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 no. Like, it's almost also like I didn't realize how Twitter worked. You know, and I thought I could just like, I, w- I don't really mean it. Like, you're the best <laughs> ever. I mean, I kind of do about that movie, but like, I would not die on this cross like ever. There's so many more people like you're the best and also really nice and really talented. Like why, if I'm, if you're going to do that, let it be someone that you don't care if comes. I'm sorry to hear that, Mary Lynn. <laughs> <laughs> of course I try to like take it back. I'm like, you know, I was just uh, trying to, I, uh, you're great. Uh, 
That is so fucking gr- that is that is the epitome of like of just this reckless abandon with which I speak constantly and I just go and then you say something <laughs> horrific and someone's like yo man like I was a big fan and you're like fuck I didn't know you were listening god that is I didn't I saw I saw someone was like you ever see someone grab a tweet you did like years ago i mean like i did a tweet like i want to say nine years ago just trashing kim kardashian and 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 by the way i like kim kardashian and i'm like but apparently apparently that night i was drunk and i was just like you are the fucking like and and i'm i was like i I just want to go through and clean up my history because you don't know what you say about people and then you meet them in person you're like oh hey how you doing and by the way i've i've said stuff i've said stuff bad about people that i know in person recently that i regret Re- like recently like I, I i everyone goes uh well they're pulling up tweets from fucking 10 years ago you can pull up things f- i said last week and i'm like <laughs> i'm like oh um you can do no wrong though you just let it come out of your mouth and you know that's you yeah well we'll see we'll see i i i i i, I uh i think that's part of being un- i want i want to be less exposed I want to be, I don't want to overexpose myself. I want to expose myself just enough to, uh, to the people that want to see me. I don't want to be like, I don't need to be the voice of, of city, city bank credit cards or whatever. Like I just want to, I just need to make a little bit of a living so that I can send my one daughter to college and my other daughter to trade school. And I would uh, be the voice of city bank. If that's on the table, I'll do that. I'll be the voice of city bank. Yeah. Yeah. I get afraid of that. I feel like once you get those things, that's when they start coming for you. That's when they oh, go. They want to knock you down. I th- I feel like it. Like like uh, I I got an offer to do something with a company. This is how superstitious I am. Okay, I had a friend who got canceled. I'm not gonna say any names. I have a friend who got canceled, and he had a big campaign for a a corporation, and then the corporation fires him. Fires him. How dare he? Right. And then the corporation came to me and they're like, we want you to be our spokesman. And I was like, no, nah, man, I think Good you're bad you. luck. I don't fuck with you. I, I think you're the one that brought on that shit to him. <laughs> and so That's I won't smart. do that. I mean, that kind of goes back to what you're saying of, of the Patrice thing of like, I want my audience of people that know who I am. And it's enough to be that. You know what I mean? Like what you were saying about being married. It's like, it's enough to keep your own shit intact. And I think that's very... Uh, smart of you to i had i had such anxiety when i worked at travel channel that i would be found out by the network and fired that they would go wait you're smoking weed on joe rogan's podcast wait what are you saying about women or or about anyone about like whatever the fuck would come in i like i i would do i've said this so much i've said it so much i should stop saying it because i'm probably putting a target on me but i would do rogan's podcast back in the day and not remember how i got home and be like so let i really don't remember what i said so yeah, yeah. and then you just go i remember when joe went over to spotify he took all his podcast episodes off youtube and i was like Phew. <laughs> but i remember travel channel would i remember you want to hear something really funny so Hell yeah how long were you on travel channel like nine years oh oh my god it was that long that's awesome yeah i was on for a, a my probably my when i should have been doing specials i was doing travel channel and i couldn't do a special i wrote a book and they like they wanted to read it and they wanted to make sure it was okay and oh, shit and so like they i had like a morality clause and i couldn't like they would come to my shows and they'd be a little suspect of like well what are you talking about on stage and i remember i hope this comes out kindly because i don't want this person to think that this is negative if they heard it i won't say anything but there was a person at travel channel that was kind of my liaison who definitely was like hey if you're writing a book we need to see it we need to see what's in it because you know there's certain subject matter we're not comfortable with you approaching and i was like i understand and so they never really edited me they were really cool but but there i always understood that there was this this hatchet waiting to drop and and land on me if i if i got out of line and then this liaison uh what tried stand up that she tried that that person tried stand up for for one time and went on stage and i'm not saying it was exactly this but it was like man what's up with retards and i'm like what the (laughs) fuck (laughs) 
wanted to be like, it's not so easy when you don't <laughs> like, it's uh, easy to edit. But then when you got to get up there and, and you got to tell, and I remember just being like, ah, that just so you know, that's not brand friendly for travel channel. <laughs> that's amazing. It was, it was, I remember watching it and then, and she, uh, this, but what sucks is if this person heard this, they'd be like, that's not what I said. Cause, and they'd be upset that I, that that would be my recollection because I really love this person. It was like my closest person at travel channel. But I remember watching her stand up and being like, Whoa, this is not brand friendly with the network. Well, she And she may have been in the same position as you just like trying to keep her job, but she yeah. herself, um, she was cool as fuck. She, I, I, I don't, I don't want to paint her negatively, but I remember constantly. I mean, when I would do Rogan, I would ask red band to turn the camera off me when I smoked weed. And that was kind of understood is that, if a joint was being passed, just don't put the camera on me. And I would smoke it and then just because I remember smoking on camera and one of the execs was like, yo, you can't smoke weed on camera. And I was like, it's 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 OK. And then but I, I think I also learned in a weird way to be a tat. I think it changed my 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 perception of myself and what i needed to be i mean there's parts of me that still tries to say shocking things to get a laugh out of my friends on a podcast and say outrageous things but i think for the most part it dialed me into a little more confident me and taught me a lot more about like you don't need to be the you don't need to be the most shocking foulest dude in the room all the time you can also just sit back in the cut and not speak which this isn't my strong suit well i thought you were gonna say it was about the weed smoking. I thought you were going like I I became a little bit more responsible. No, I regret everything with drugs and alcohol because now raising two daughters, it is very hard to put parameters down when you have lived a lifestyle of debauchery. Ubly. <laughs> Dad. They're like, it's been it's it's been a very it's been a big challenge to explain rules when you are famous for breaking them your whole life, you know? Yeah. I don't know. How old's your son? How old's your son? He's 12. Oh, you're in the sweet spot. They still he still loves you. Does he? <laughs> <laughs> he told me this morning, hugs are for losers. <laughs> <laughs> Who says that? Hugs are for losers. Oh. Oh, they stopped touching me a long time ago. Really? Oh yeah, they even the lady, the girls. Oh, oh. The, the girls will not. The, the, no, Dad, gross. I remember saying, "Hey, George, come sit on my lap," and I think she was probably like, whatever age she was. You know what it was? It was when she, once she got her period, it she shifted immediately. She was cuddly, lovey. I mean, the greatest fucking kid, the great, not saying that she's not right now, but like really honestly, the most dialed in emotional child where, I mean, just brilliant still is, it's still there. But when she got her period, all of a sudden it was like, it was like, I definitely got a little bit of a Heisman in life about, I need my distance. And I remember my wife telling me, yo, you got to give her her space. Like she wants, she wants to grow. This is independence. And I was so lost. I said. So wait, I got to pretend to not, to not be that into her. She was like, what? I was like, <laughs> and it's, I said, to, I said to someone, I said, I, I said, having teenage daughters is like breaking up with your girlfriend, but then living in the same apartment with them. Oh no. Cause they it's don't every day. It's like, you do great things like this morning, this morning I got up and I, they they had their first day of golf practice. Right. Cause they just joined the golf team. So I bought them golf clubs. I bought them golf balls. I bought them a net. I bought them everything. I get them in. I throw everything in the back of the car. And I'm like, I go, Hey, I, I just want you guys to know I got everything. It's in the car. And they're, and they're just like, okay. And I was like, so have a great day. And let me know. I want to die. And I know how golf goes. And they're like, dad enough. <laughs> and then I was like, I love you guys. And they're like, uh. they'll just go, uh. and they just go so get in the car. And you just, and you just sit in there like, and then you re then you realize, oh, I'm, I'm in, I, I'm in, I have run in very short running shorts. I'm in running shorts with no shirt on, and they're just looking at me like a disgusting pig, going, "I love you guys," and they're like, "Ugh." Oh. 
Yeah. Uh, you really painted the picture. So you're saying I need to like start wearing bikinis as he turns 13 and 14. Just yeah. Be- just milf it up. Give me a hug. I need to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 We got into a fight the other night and then like wait, I, like an hour and a half later, he, we were walking and it would calm down. And he's like, yeah, I think it's just the hormones. Like totally had the wherewithal to say that. I was like, oh, you're killing me. But yeah, we've become, we can't help it. You're you're that guy now. You're just gonna be like you break. You're breaking my heart. And yes, I wear shorts with no shirt. And um, I'm your parent. I said I said to her, you know, I mean, I, how cool is this? I go listen. Uh, when things open back up in the fall, uh, I want to take you and your friends. I'll fly you guys out, get you on the tour bus, and then when I hit some of these cities that have good big colleges, I want you to see these colleges. I want you to see what these colleges look like. And she's like, I, I think I'm gonna pass. And I went i'm like what the fuck like i'm like no one has getting these opportunities in life like you have no idea the things i I, like i get so lost in like parenting because i i want to make sure that they get everything they get but then you also want to give them a tad bit of hardship and like she she quit her softball team and just like i'm getting a job and i was like you're not getting a job in the fucking pandemic okay wow. <laughs> she's oh like and, and oh and just just to spite me just to spite me I said, you're not quitting softball. She just quit. She was like, fuck you. And I went, and then, uh, Where does she want to get a job? Uh, dad, anywhere. I'll get a job. I will. Why don't you volunteer your time? No, dad, I want a job with my friends at like fucking Etsy or what? Not Etsy, but like 20, forever 21. Or I was like, all these stores are closed. You're not getting a job. Yeah, no shit, dude. Let her do it. First of all, they're closed. And then like enjoy minimum wage where, you go buy yourself lunch and then you're like, that was my wages for the day. Cool. I go first of all, and then they, they, this is where I, I got attacked pretty aggressively. As I said, you uh, don't need money. And in the pandemic, there are people who have a, a single, a single mother that has a child that has lost a job that needs a job. And you're not taking that job away from that mother. You will sit in your room and you will do nothing. Uh, and my wife is just like, you don't talk to anyone like that. And then it's just, it literally I'm in therapy now and I, I subtract myself from situations because I get, I don't know, it's whatever fucking, I'm, what are my parenting skills lack? And I haven't, I haven't been parenting their whole lives. I've been on the road and now all of a sudden I'm here just fucking guess who knows how to make pasta. Here we go. (laughs) Fucking it up left and right. (laughs) I just want to be alive long enough to watch Tom fuck his kids up. Tom and Christina. <laughs> oh, boy. Yeah. Have you thought about moving when every, while everyone's moving? Have you thought? That's funny because I just did their podcast, and I, I didn't realize until I started texting with her that they were moving to, um, and that kind of blew my mind. I mean, I, I just, yeah. Um, I did. I moved from Encino to, like, way deeper in the valley. And that was my version as if I moved out of state. I'm just that's like, your Texas. <laughs> yeah, that's my Texas. <laughs> just take me deep into the valley and bye-bye. My, I walk with like this 70-year-old guy every day and his dog's old too. And he's uh, like an actor. Like he talks about the love boat and like Mike Hammer and stuff. And all these like, po- like a pilot he almost got. And he's like, I could give you a contact if you need one. I was like, dude, <laughs> like he wakes up. It's like six in the morning and he's like a player talking about like the script he wrote and stuff like that. Um, I'm just, I'm five years from that. <laughs> <laughs> let me tell you how you get booked at the Omaha funny bone. Colleen's yeah. passed, but let me tell you something. Her son. <laughs> uh, but yeah, that's where I, I chose to live. I, I, uh, Sold my house in Encino, got the equity out of it, and just like, bye-bye. Like, I don't know. Hopefully, we won't get to, like, civil war. Th- things seem to be okay now. But, um, yeah, I can't believe the number of people that have moved. It's uh, it's crazy. It really is crazy. I, I'm starting to do uh, in-person podcasts, socially distant, COVID-tested, outdoor podcasts. And I put a tweet out to comedians. I was like, yo, if you're a comedian, you're still in L.A., hit me up. Chris Porter replied. That's it. Chris Porter. 
Oh, thank God, Chris is still. I mean, the store is going to be completely different. Yeah, we're going to run shit. We're going to be fucking <laughs> king and queen of Hollywood. Not, here I come. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my God. That's going to be great. Actually. I don't have to go on at 1130 or midnight anymore. Uh, I'm going to be, this is going to be, Oh, I'm going to be like Carlos Mencia. I'm going to do two hours. <laughs> Hell yeah, you are. Are you kidding? You're going to be, it's going to be like Burt Kreischer's main room. <laughs> <laughs> just fucking, I swear to God, I'm doubling down. I'm doubling down on Hollywood. I'm, <laughs> I'm watching. I'm, I, and then Tom and Christina, what we should do is we should plan a weekend to do their podcast. Cause they're, they're, they're getting a guest house. And they're like, you know, whenever you come down to do the podcast, you can just stay in our guest house. We should plan a party at their guest house. Hell yeah. And we'll just invite everyone. Be like, hey guys, party at Tom and Christina's guest house. They're going to buy, I, I hope they're living on a lake. We'll be in bathing suits. We'll be fucking just relaxing. Like going right for the jugular. Cause I remember her telling me, she's like, yeah, we're not going to do the studio at the house. You're like, yeah, we're going to bring it right to your we're guest house. It. Oh, I'm, I'm going to be like a bad Polly Shore movie. Just fucking never or Sinbad, whatever fucking movie that was. We got to get a dead body and just dress it up and carry it around. Right. Or I'll just black out and you guys can do that with me. Perfect. <laughs> Dude, I really appreciate you doing this, Mary Lynn. I, uh, I know it's been fun. I'm watching Thank you on you Instagram. Thank you for having me. Jeez. I no, no, it's, it. it's been great. I'm such a fan of yours uh, for the longest time. And, uh, and when things get less crazy, I'd love to have you over to the new podcast studio and do one in person. Maybe, you know, love that. Yeah. We'll get into it again. Yeah. I'm, gl I'm really glad we did this. I'm glad I got to speak with you. I appreciate it. And, uh, and I will reach out, uh, I'll reach out when things start getting less crazy and we have to plan our first trip to Tom and Christina's. Yes. <laughs> and not bring I'll our bring kid the LED and light just and the party machine. balls <laughs> I'll, I'll just have like a half a glass of rosé that's how i party balls okay and i'll have the other half and okay. the bottle <laughs> okay, perfect awesome well it was great talking to you, marilyn i will yeah. uh hopefully i'll see you in soon in person and until then we'll, we'll take over the store hell yes okay. hell yes all right bye bye, -bye.